So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, I hope you're not angry anymore and you're not tired. Uh, I'll try to make it uh, interesting today. I know you have uh, good other options, so I'm uh, very excited you're here today. Uh, it wouldn't be a Taylor Swift show, but uh, I hope it will be interesting enough. I will try to, as long as it will be great. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Yoar. I'm coming from uh, a long background in IT, DevOps, DevSecOps, work for corporates and uh, government and startups. And uh, um, I feel very privileged because I work for in an era that uh, people actually deployed servers in React and connected cables to uh, networking uh, appliances and, and firewalls and all the way to the application level, um, which, you know, we not not a lot of people get to do it today, so uh, I'm very uh, privileged for that. And um, actually, I uh, started uh, uh, my own uh, startup about a couple of years ago. And the the reason being, prior to that, I've uh, I've been working at uh, Microsoft in the cloud application security group, and uh, we were one of the companies that's been hit by the SolarWinds attack. And my team was actually part of the incident response group for that. And, you know, after that, we sat down and we did some threat modeling and we tried to understand, okay, if something like that were to happen to Microsoft or one of the open source we're using, are we protected? Um, and we had a bunch of tools in the SDLC. The answer was uh, no, unfortunately, and I really wanted to build something that uh, would be able to uh, tackle that. Yeah, other than that, I really love music. I uh, don't get a chance to do it uh, a lot, and I really love uh, animals uh, all across. Um, so let's let's touch uh, some of the uh, uh, trends first. So we're kind of more than four years after the poster kid solo winds attack, and the, the, the attacks number is, uh, is growing. And um, in my opinion, there are kind of uh, two reasons for that. So the... Uh, the first reason would be, um, and I'm sure you guys here in the audience know more than I, that most of our code base is, uh, is open source based, and uh, that puts a lot of risk because we can't really control uh, the security of that, right? Because open source maintainers cannot implement the same security mechanism as enterprise security. And the, uh, the second thing is the incentive, because eventually, if I attack uh, one company that has many customers, or if I attack like a, a really prominent open source project, I'm able to get to many companies. In contrary, if I go and attack, you know, in the old ways where I'll be attacking one company, try to, to find like an open Tomcat server, do slash admin admin, and then maybe I'm in the organization, but now I'm just in one organization. So, um, Let's talk about the attack type. So what you see here on the screen are the more stealthy kind of attacks, but we see a lot of kind of like script kiddies attack that uh, would upload a malicious package directly to maybe, if they are smart, they will put it directly in NPM and will attach a legitimate source code, but most of the time that will they will just push malicious code to the source code repository, to GitHub, and then they will push it to uh, NPM, but, um, we still see people uh, download that in the uh, hundreds and even thousands of that. But what we see here is the, uh, the, are the attacks that are a bit more stealthier. So we'll dive to that in a bit. And just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, there's a core difference, as you can see on the screen, between a vulnerability and an attack, right? So vulnerability, most of the time, unless you're a very sophisticated person, would be a, a mistake done by a developer that been, you know, get into open source, your own, your own organization. Um, it's easy to identify it. Uh, almost every SCA solution can identify that. And it's easy, it's easier to uh, defend it before exploit by upgrading the package. Um, and I, I'm putting uh, regular vulnerabilities and zero days in the same, uh, in the same category. Uh, where a uh, supply chain attack, it's, uh, it's a bit harder because it's not really, you can't really find it in a CVE database. So you need another mechanism to detect it. And usually it's malicious by nature. So if somebody attacks an open source or your own uh, organization, it will be exploited or active. So it will send environment variables outside of the organization. So you wouldn't need to do anything for that to be exploited, for example. Um, 
How does this uh, reflect on the SDLC if we kind of uh, track it down to a few areas? So the first thing is the developer. And, and let's, uh, let's rule out two things. The first one is developer mistakes because we're speaking about attacks, right? Uh, mistakes can be uh, detected with a SAS tool, right? Um, the second thing is uh, internal intrusion inside of the organization. Let's say we have like a very angry employee or just somebody uh, uh, malicious inside the organization. Eventually that person would be able to, to get to the resource they, uh, they want to get to. You can implement some kind of mechanism like, you know, just-in-time access, role-based access. Make sure that uh, I see it a lot of times in our, with our customers that uh, a developer might get uh, access to all of the organization, although they don't really need that. So that's just good practices to have. The second thing would be the compromise of the source control. We don't see that a lot because think about it. If you push code directly to the repository, it's visible. So it might be a bit less visible uh, if you bypass the pull request and you commit directly to the repository with a nice commit message, but still it's in the history, it's visible, it's in the source code, it's in the history. Um, but we'll talk about an interesting uh, attack over there. And then uh, um, we have the interesting part, with the, which is the build integrity. So we can compromise uh, a build platform like happened with 3CX, or solo winds, um, we can bypass a CI CD, which we see a lot with open source, because think about it. If I took over an account maintainer in an open source package, push the package directly to the artifact repository, like to NPM, PyP, Maven, etc., cetera, um, source code is legit, right? You can look, in, you can look at the source code and, and, and you're good to go, but the actual binary or the transpiled package uh, is malicious. And the last one is the um, um, one before the last one is the compromised package repository, um, like we've seen with the Jump Cloud one. So when an attacker got to the Jump Cloud organization, went all the way to the framework server, added malicious code before it went out to the Jump Cloud agents. And the use the, the use bad dependency is the more complex one because if we're looking at all of the uh, um, attack surface we just uh, spoke about like multiply that by tens and hundreds, right? Because each and every open source package is using tens other, if not more, other open source packages and we can be attacked by the weakest link. And as I mentioned before, we can't really expect uh, open source maintainers to implement the same security that the enterprise, uh, the enterprise does. And eventually, I've been a developer. I guess there are many developers in the audience. I will usually look for a package that I need. I will choose the first one that answer my criteria. Probably, I will see if it has a lot of maybe stars, maybe a lot of downloads uh, uh, in the package repository. I wouldn't check the source code. I wouldn't see if they're implementing any kind of uh, uh, security tools, probably. I wouldn't check the amount of pull requests open. So. Immediately, uh, at least the developers uh, I've been working and myself, I can say that, and I see myself as a very security forward uh, person, usually want to get the task done. Um, so let's talk about actually how software supply chain attacks can come from various areas. Let's start with the ID. The ID is an interesting place because it's not in the SDLC yet, kind of, depends how you look at it. Uh, but it's the most sensitive place in the organization, one of the most sensitive places. Why? Because we're not only hosting uh, source code, um, which, uh, by the way, it's, uh, we had an indication at Microsoft that somebody managed to leak the, like the Windows XP source code, and nobody, nobody really cared because good luck. Even at Microsoft, we didn't know how to compile it. Um, but think about it. The ID, we have the source code, and then a lot of the times we have environment files uh, that contain secrets. Uh, maybe you're using serverless frameworks or Terraform credentials, a lot of things that we don't find in the grid repository because you want to deploy directly for your computer to a staging environment, for example. So it's a very risky place. Um, VS Code. Uh, VS Code, according to, uh, at least for 2022, is the most uh, used um, uh, IDE. It might have changed a bit, but I think it, uh, it wouldn't be very dramatic. Um, again, by professional developers, of course, and 
um, a lot of people use VS Code and then the combination of IntelliJ or, or PyCharm, of course, uh, for different reasons. Um, and the power of this platform comes from the extensibility it has. So it has tons of plugins anywhere from themes to linting to debugging to uh, language support, of course. And again, I can say that the only reason I myself used to check the extension I was downloading is just to see uh, um, which uh, extension has the higher, highest number of uh, uh, downloads. And that really helped me, you know, kind of understand uh, which uh, extension to choose. I didn't really check what does it mean, uh, what do I need to check more than that. That's not the right one. Let's see. Okay, we're good now, okay, for now. Um, let's move on. Hope I, over, I don't have any uh, idea with secrets open. Um, this is a really cool research. Um, there have been a few researchers uh, around the VS Code malicious extension. The reason I like this one is A, because it's recent. Um, the second thing, uh, the outcome was uh, uh, mo more prominent because they managed to, to get to a pretty big organization very little effort. Um, this has been done by Amita, uh, Amita Asraf, which is a very talented uh, uh, researcher, and he did a, a type of squatting attack. So type of squatting is uh, a matter of changing maybe one or two letters in the package, or in this case, uh, VS Code extension, and then tricking developers into uh, downloading that. Microsoft makes it very easy to use that uh, tactic. So instead of Dracula, they did uh, Darkula, which, pun intended, it actually makes more uh, makes a lot of sense. The second thing you can see it's actually verified. So you can you can attach any dom any domain you want basically, and it will uh, give you that nice blue blue tag. So you're verified. It doesn't matter if it's not the uh, the official one. And the last quirk, which we see a lot with uh, open source packages as well, and package managers in general, when you upload a package, you can attach any source code you want. So they, um, he actually attached the original, the genuine uh, source code. So nobody would uh, suspect, and nobody is checking that. So now, actually, uh, this is his part, part of his malicious code. The malicious code basically does um, a few simple things. Any code uh, tab you open, it sends to the CNC server. And then metadata-wise, they send the name of the computer and some information about the computer, as you can see here, back to the CNC server. And literally five minutes after they upload the, the, the package, first machine got in, a um, few minutes later, and days after, hundreds of downloads without doing any promotion. Um, also, the uh, malicious, ma malicious extension was trending after a couple of days, and the way it did that, another quick with uh, uh, Microsoft, is that they did install bomb. Basically, you write a script, you install your extension thousands or hundreds of thousands of times, and, and that's it. It shows in the, uh, in the downloads. You don't really need to do anything for that because there's no uh, exclusive mechanism on the uh, VS Code marketplace. And the biggest achievement, a few, de a few days later, uh, a victim machine uh, from a network of a, a, a very big publicly traded company showed up in their server. A few days later, 10 more, company, 10 more companies, including a big security company, and inclu including uh, um, a company with like the internal network of a core system which is crazy, basically without doing anything uh, very uh, extreme. So what is the biggest problem with uh, the, the VS Code uh, exten extensions? Two big problems. One, no permission management. Basically, uh, a theme extension can access the same data as a LinkedIn extension, so it can, it can access the code. Um, and this, and the, second, the second thing would be, basically, think about it, it's running as VS Code, so it's trusted by 
by the EDR, it's, it's not even sandboxed. It's running in the same context of the VS Code uh, executable, which is a big problem. Add to that, it can also upgrade behind the scenes. So it can automatically uh, upgrade to the latest version. So think about it. If I'm a malicious sector, I can publish uh, uh, the first version. The first version will be legitimate. Uh, the second one will be legitimate, and then it will automatically uh, auto-upgrade to the malicious version. By the way, there's been a open uh, GitHub request since 2018 that asking Microsoft to implement at least a permission management. You know, like we have on Android, you need access to the file system, great. So let's do like permission on demand for that. Um, nothing yet. Um, how can we protect? So the first, the first part goes without saying, educate developers. We all know that's not like the most amazing solution because eventually somebody will, will do mistakes. Um, but I have to put it up. The second thing would be to block VS Code network access. Also, it, this is a bit excessive, um, but you can, you can do that. You can block it on the uh, machine firewall by group policy or something else, and you can install, install the extensions uh, manually by file, so those will be extensions on your own server that are approved by the organization. And the, the third option is to use an extension scanning tool such as uh, Extension Total that did built by uh, me that actually did uh, this research. And I'm sure that will be more community tools, but it's a, it's a community tool so you can all use it. It's a, it's a great tool. Um, but again, um, put an emphasis because that's in the hand of uh, your developers. And I think that's a, a very easy attack vector and also um, a very prominent one. Let's move another step forward to the SCM. So the good news is that you wouldn't find a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, let's say, or exploitabilities on the SCM level. Uh, and also, think about it again, if I push code to, to the repository, again, it's visible. Uh, again, and I'm putting TFS and SVN aside because uh, I hope nobody is using it still and it's time to refresh uh, your resume if you are. Um, and I think uh, the, the nice thing that once in a while, there's a quirk with the platform as a service provider. So GitHub, GitLab, etc. sometimes because they wrap our Git, right? So let's take a use case. This is a, a, a GitHub flow, which actually is also a GitLab flow, where basically you can go to any repository. It can, it can be an open source repository or your own repository. You can put a comment, you don't even have to publish that. So when you go to a comment and you upload a file, you immediately get uh, um, this file path you see here. So it's GitHub slash the organization, the official, official organization, repository files, and a unique ID. And if you think about it, we can go to NVIDIA's uh, repository, to the dr drivers, for example, repository, upload uh, a malicious uh, file. Um, So this is exactly what these guys here do. So this is a, a Redline is a powerful information steal and malware, and they went ahead and uploaded to the Microsoft official repository to VC package uh, specifically here, malicious file, uh, the, the, the specific malware. So um, the malicious actor actually uploaded the, the malware, but we still have to make people download that. How do we do that? We can basically uh, upload it to, let's say, uh, YouTube because it's a game. It's, uh, they try to uh, give a, a, like a cheat to, to people that use gaming, uh, uh, to, that use games, and say, if you install that and you convince your friends to install that, we'll give you a bunch of cheats to your games. Uh, so they go on peer-to-peer -peer networks, forums, and YouTube, and then they make the people download that. And um, the actual malware is uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it's an installer, and then the installer drops a bunch of files. And you can see here, here we have an obfuscated malicious code. So when you install the software itself, uh, while the compilation is happening, it packs the malicious code. And again, the usual stuff, password stealing from uh, a Chrome injector that is able to steal autofill information and passwords and send it back to the, uh, to the malicious uh, actor. Um, no response for Microsoft, um, seeing kind of a pattern here. Uh, no response for Microsoft so far. Uh, this is uh, still available for uh, abuse. 
And the problem is, it's not really easy to solve that. So you can do two things. If you know that somebody is using your repository to distribute malicious files, you can contact GitHub and ask them to download that, to remove that, sorry. Or you can disable comments, which is not really feasible. So if you disable comments, no one, be, no one be, would be able to uh, publish comments on pull requests. Uh, and it will autom automatically will enable itself in six months. And the last thing, just don't neglect your uh, SCM. We spoke about it a few slides back. Uh, again, make sure that only the needed uh, people have uh, uh, permissions. Again, it wouldn't help a lot in the case of uh, the, pull, the uh, comments because everybody can use comments. It's not a matter of uh, pushing code to the repository, but just to emphasize on that. The most interesting thing, the XDUTLs that happened about uh, a couple of months ago already, um, and it's a fun one because, um, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of attack vector that is easy on one hand, it's very similar to the VS extension one, um, but it's also complex, but I chose a complex attack just to show you the, the amount of thought that's been uh, implemented on the malware. But if we look at other attacks, like uh, um, the UA parser that happened in 2021, basically, very simple one. It took over a maintainer, again, with spare phishing, uploaded a malicious package to the NPM repository, source code is legitimate, millions of downloads. Everybody is using UA parser to get user agents uh, in their web application. That's it, I'm, I'm, I arrived to as many companies as uh, I could just imagine. Um, but for this attack, let's start from the end. Uh, this guy, Andres, is a Microsoft developer, and on his daily work, he's uh, um, working on Postgres. And all of a sudden, he found out that um, while working, he was trying to SSH to his box, and what he saw, that it took him a lot of time. So this cool developer actually opened uh, Valgrind to understand um, why is it taking so long, uh, so long? And he saw that there, the CPU cycle is very, very long, and he figured, listen, uh, I thought it might be with the uh, operating system, but I just realized I, I updated uh, uh, the operating system, and I see a new package. That this package, the XUTLs package, is taking a lot of CPU cycles, so I think it's, uh, I think it's been backdoor for my I'm thinking in the commit history, um, which... Basically, this is crazy because it could have been distributed for uh, most of the most uh, prominent um, Linux distribution like Fedora and, uh, and Debian. Um, the XUT specifically, it, it provides critical uh, operations for compression and decompression in uh, Unix-like systems. So um, how did the uh, militia sector even manage to contribute to the project? If we think about it, maintaining an open source is a very, very uh, tiring thing. And the maintainer, the original maintainer, had some personal, is personal issues with his life like everybody else. And he's working on that for free. And this is not like a, a, an easy library to maintain. It is very, very complex. Uh, so there's the attacker that uh, got to the repository and says, I'll help you start pushing some uh, legitimate source code, opening pull requests, trying to help the original maintainer. And then slowly they do a nice trick. What they, uh, they do, they go into the uh, forum and the, and the uh, GitHub uh, repository and they say, listen, there's a huge backlog and you're not able to release the versions. We need somebody else, and he, and he creates fake, fake accounts, and those accounts, uh, they do the same thing. They say, listen, we really need help. We need somebody to help us actually uh, maintain this repository. So this guy says, listen, I've had enough. Uh, let's, uh, this GIA 10 take over the repository. Boom, he's the, uh, now is the release manager of the repository. Uh, this is the interesting commit, basically, that started this whole malware. So... After two years of being silent, this uh, uh, Giatan decides that I'm going to push two malicious binaries to the uh, repository. Why? Because it's binaries, I can say that those are test binaries, and nobody will understand that they are malicious because we can't really inspect them with, again, 
any of, of our uh, security tools. So we put that in the test library, and then uh, you can ignore all of that. That's, uh, I'm putting that in presentation just for you to see. And then basically what happens is that these binaries in the compilation uh, process, they manipulate the make file uh, to inject malicious code, and that make file basically manipulates the um, SSHD, and then the actual attack, when somebody connects to the uh, SSH server, if, the, if it's the attacker, it can send a specific SSH key, and the RSA function is, is responsible for the decryption, sees, okay, this is the attacker SSH, uh, I'm going to log him in and allow him to send remote commands to the computer. Super complex, like I, I barely managed to write a low world, and this guy is like uh, all over the top. And, and then basically the guy already says, amazing, I'm about, I've just released two, uh, two malicious version, and he goes in uh, to the maintainers of uh, Fedora and Debian, and he says, listen, uh, let's, uh, I, I, I've implemented many, many fixes. Maybe you can help me push that to the uh, to your version, and he and he succeeds, and uh, it's been uh, merged into Fedora, Debian, and uh, Kali and OpenSUSE. But uh, it's been kept really, really uh, fast by uh, Andres. But it could be a, a really, really crazy impact. What I wanted to show you here is that we've done the same. So the same maintainer was responsible for the XZ Java uh, repository. So we said, okay, let's do something like that. Let's be the malicious binary, upload that to Maven. It's been, it's been there from uh, May. You can see it has uh, uh, zero vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities, so no uh, uh, security scanner can actually catch that. It's there, it's still there, by the way. And what we've done is that we've put uh, malicious code that uh, opens a socket. Anytime there's a, a stream operation, it opens a socket. And then uh, it basically allows us to send command back to the computer. So what we've done is that we've taken that binary. This is the decompilation of the binary after, of course, we uh, took it back from bytecode straight to source code. On the left side in really, really small is uh, the original source code. This is exactly what happened in the uh, exutils attack. And the binary is malicious. Source code is legitimate. It's still hosted on Maven. Anybody can download that. And again, uh, they won't take it down. And uh, just, just, just to show you how, it, uh, how easy it is to actually upload malicious uh, packages without being detected, because eventually it looks like legitimate code, no signature on that. Um, how do we protect? So for vulnerabilities, yes. Still use your scanning tool, your SCA, that will have vulnerabilities. Um, if you have any tool that can scan for malicious code in the open source repository and your binaries, use it. Make sure it's integrated in your, in your environment. Um, open source or in general, uh, uh, any, any code uh, repository shouldn't contain binaries unless you have a very specific use case. If you need test cases, it's usually accomplished by code or at least uh, it will be compiled in the process and not uh, specific as binaries. Um, and attestation, attestation means that I'm checking each step of the build uh, or the SDLC and I'm saying what needs to happen and I'm cryptography uh, signing that. So at the end of the process I can say, okay, this binary has been created from this uh, source code. There are many frameworks we can use like uh, Intoto or two from the distribution server. Um, I can recommend if you, if you want. And there's another option like uh, binary to source, which is basically attestation in reverse. Um, it's, it's very similar to what we've done here, where we took the binary, we decompiled it, and we trace it back to the source code to understand if it matches. Uh, there's a really good Black Hat presentation by Jeremy, which is uh, from OWASP, about uh, this, um, this mechanism. Last one. 60 more minutes and we're done, because I see people... I'm kidding, just 10 minutes. Um, this one is interesting. Uh, it's very similar to the SolarWinds one, and, but it's a very small company. 36 is a company that has 200 employees, but 600,000 customers. And they do um, a PBX system basically for voice and video and, and text. And they, they're, they're being used, as you can see, by the biggest uh, brands in the world. Um, this is the attack flow. 
You want uh, three seconds to read it? Okay. I will explain it really, really quickly. The interesting thing here is that it's actually a double supply chain attack. It started with um, it started with an employee downloading a software called Xtrader, discontinued software for some reason, um, and downloading it to the computer. This software itself was infected with malware. The way it works, basically, there's a setup installation. It drops uh, DLS on the as part of that installation. Uh, side loading that malicious DLS as part of the executable. Side loading is a really good technique because you can you can use the, le the legitimate signature of the original executable and actually uh, side load malicious DLLs. Um, long story short, they're using a, a, a shell code and then a decryption uh, tool to decrypt, uh, extract the malware, throw it on the computer. As part of the malware uh, is, is installed uh, a publicly um, uh, found software we call the first reverse proxy that allows the attacker to actually connect with reverse tunnel back to the uh, computer. This is the first part, but till this day we have no idea why the employee downloaded this software. It's a it's a trade like financing trading software. Anyway, we're on the employee computer now. The attacker wants to get to the uh, to the uh, build servers. So again, as I've mentioned, he has a, a reverse proxy to the uh, employee, and then lateral movement inside of the organization. Uh, uh, fast forward, he is able to uh, reach the Windows build server and the Mac build server. Uh, install persistency uh, shell code over there that basically allowed him then to connect to that server and inject malicious code. So the same has happened, similar to what happened in uh, uh, in SolarWinds, as part of the build process, he included uh, malicious code and injected that as part of the uh, um, compilation, which eventually means again, no malicious code in the repository, there is malicious code in the final artifact. Very complex to, the, to detect. Um, final malware, so it's an Electron app that goes to the customers. Basically, uh, the, the application, again, it's legitimately signed because it's part of the CI CD goes to the artifact server, customers download it, malicious DLL drops in the computer, and then the malware sleeps for anywhere between uh, one to four weeks just so the uh, uh, person wouldn't su suspect that something is happening, uh, goes to GitHub to download the malicious icon file, icon file is being decrypted, malicious payload, command and control center, stealing, ma stealing uh, uh, sensitive data. The same trick that, we, that we've seen with uh, the other previous uh, attacks. And this is the interesting one, because how was this attack detected? Uh, EDR started um, notifying that. So they, started, they, they detected malicious activity when it got to the uh, computer of the uh, victims. And then people started reaching out to 3 cs and they said, Listen, my EDR or my antivirus is trying to detect suspicious uh, activities. Can you help with that? And the employee told them, listen, thousands of antivirus out there. Uh, we've seen false positives in the past. Talk to your company. It's not us. So what can we do? First of all, understand that um, a lot of people, uh, um, people ask me, well, it's signed. Uh, maybe you can compare signatures. It's not enough. Signed doesn't mean trusted. Uh, in this case, the CI/CD build was signed, legitimately, legitimately signed by the computer, uh, by the uh, CI/CD system. But if we go back to the initial attack vector, to the uh, first attack in this process where the employee downloaded the malicious software, uh, we have a vulnerability in the trust in the signature validation that allows people um, to add more content uh, to the uh, uh, binary and actually keep the same signature or a legitimate, uh, legitimate signature. Um, it's been fixed by Microsoft in 2013, but a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, companies still haven't uh, implemented that because uh, it's not backward compatible and some uh, 
Uh, some tools are still using um, uh, signature changing because it's specifically in Chrome, for example, when you send logouts, it uses the Chrome DLL, but it uh, uses uh, to append content to the authenticated uh, signature. The second thing, and I believe that most of you is using that already, disposable build servers. Um, even you have like a master Jenkins or something like that, make sure that the build server that actually build your code or test your code or whatever is run on Docker's disposable clean image that's been uh, um, executed uh, every time uh, uh, fresh. It wouldn't help if the malicious uh, code is from open source because the same open source will be included every time, but it wouldn't allow anybody to gain persistency that easily on your uh, service. Uh, monitor activity is in quotes because, well, I mean, what can we do? Can we, will we look if somebody writes to the source code file on the CI CD? Maybe we can check if uh, network activity is uh, a bit strange. A lot of false positives, not recommended. Um, reproducible builds. That's a cool project started in 2016 that says, I will run my uh, CI CD pipeline twice in separate places, and then the signatures uh, would be uh, the same. Very complex. Uh, you, you know, uh, even if the date and time changes on the CI CD build, it yields different signatures. So I think SoloWinds implemented something like that, where they have the original build and then the second build on an offline environment, but they experience a really big, uh, big uh, like really big attack. And I think it requires a lot of manpower that nobody has. And the last thing, again, attestation. Like in open source, we can do attestation also uh, on our builds. So we can basically, on each step of the pipeline, say, I expect on the build step to get code from here. On the test step, I, I expect to, to get this and this code from here, and it's supposed to look like that. And I signed, uh, I signed each and every step with a um, temper-proof uh, signature. The last thing. Um, there was a, a great, I think, uh, a lecture here in OWASP yesterday about uh, SEM specifically. So about SDLC frameworks. Can they help? Yes. Um, will, they do, will they tell you exactly what to do? and which tools to use? No, but they can basically tell you the best practices, what you need to do in every step, what you need to do when you're developing code. Threat modeling, that's uh, an important part. They urge you to do so. What you need to do when you ingest open source, for example, maybe you use a, uh, an artifactory server and then you put only uh, open source that you allow. Maybe on the builds, again, you use a disposable build server. So I really urge you to look at either one of these repositories since we're in OWASP event, the OWASP uh, framework is really, really good, so highly, highly recommended. And remember, eventually I know that in our daily lives we are really focused on vulnerabilities. We have a huge backlog that uh, developers uh, keep pushing back on, uh, and it's important because it allows us to reduce the attack surface if we use the right context. But don't ignore the other parts because eventually you can be attacked by a supply chain attack that you're tool wouldn't detect as a vulnerability, which is, uh, uh, which is a pain. Um, I will share the presentation. I included some references for you to look. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm available by email. So I'm, if you have any questions, um, feel free. And yeah, if you have any questions now, I'm happy to answer. Easy. Okay. Okay, well, I will start with uh, the Gwen. So here you suggested some detection methodologies. Uh, however, as we know, the attackers are always evolving. Uh, hardly ever using the same thing for a very long time. How do you suggest we can mitigate that or fight against it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So I think um, if you're looking uh, 10 years ago, we didn't even treat those kind of attacks. So I think it's really important to understand the, uh, the trends of the attackers because, you know, we have the big buzzwords and everybody goes, you know, AI and prompt, uh, prompt security engineering and stuff like that. So um, 
this is a great vector as well, so open source as well. So I, I think it, it's always important to, um, to keep track of the market and see what's going on. And I think that's why people are here eventually, to understand what's happening on the, uh, on the uh, uh, breaker side and then on the defender side and combine it together and understand how can you solve that. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I know from uh, one very big uh, company that we actually work with that they compile everything from source. They use only software, OSS software, that they have self-compiled. Uh, so this is probably because of um, trying to avoid some of these risks. What do you think? I think that's a good point, and I actually forgot to mention it. So um, in Golang, for example, the open source is being built on your premise from the source. So this is a good way to at least make sure that nobody compromises the integrity of the open source build. It wouldn't help you necessarily with your organization, but that's already a lot of the risk that's being reduced. So it's a very good uh, uh, question. I appreciate it. If it answer, right? Did it answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Well, so I guess not. Thank you very much, Yoad, for the awesome presentation. Thank you so much for being here.